I think we'll go ahead and, and begin so that we can uh, make sure to, to get to fantastic com content. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clay Odom, Associate Professor in the School of Architecture. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the second in our ongoing fall lecture series. We're pleased uh, to welcome Claudia Pasquero school uh, to speak on her recent work in her uh, academic and her professional uh, office. Um, I'm, I'm um, going to pass it over to Danell Briscoe, Associate Professor in the School of Architecture shortly, but be sure to uh, stay tuned uh, to either the YouTube channel or to our Zoom broadcast and to also check the social media um, outlets of the School of Architecture for upcoming events and lectures. So I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Associate Professor Danelle Briscoe, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Clay, and the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee for giving me this opportunity to welcome to our school Dr. Claudio Pasquero. I'd like to just give a little bit of background to today's talk um, and in so doing, welcome all of our new incoming students who hopefully are listening to this and who may have not had the opportunity to even step foot in our school or our halls that uh, usually hold these events um, typically. I think last week's incredible talk with Mario Carpo and Peter Eisenman may have very well been the first lecture you've ever attended as an architecture student, uh, which that's a fairly high bar, which I believe Claudia can meet. Um, and I bring this up to say that in addition to how lectures can add meaning to your education and, and to our school in general, you'll also come to know that the school holds uh, truly outstanding symposiums throughout the year that can give a very collective depth to a specific topic and our speaker today is, uh, or was intended to be part of that last spring. In 2019, Claudia Pascaro was invited to lecture at the Other Nature Symposium and accompanying exhibition scheduled to take place just after spring break uh, last March at the school in our uh, beloved Meebane Gallery. Like many aspects we potentially took for granted last year, the event was canceled uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the exhibition postponed to this coming spring. And so that's prompted this brief Q&A and having Claudia back uh, as a lecturer this fall in its place and to be included instead, along with imagery that she'll potentially show today in the catalog. So do, to do a quick plug of what's to come with the uh, symposium or how it's um, been translated, it was originally organized uh, by myself through the Meadows Foundation Centennial Fellowship, along with Leora Vitsovsky, the director of the Center of American Architecture and Design. The upcoming Other Nature exhibit, exhibit will collectively present uh, many examples of building systems that proactively engage with nature and the potential ecological benefits offered by these systems for buildings and dense urban conditions. So scheduled for this coming February, February 2020, pencil this in, great fingers crossed, the exhibit is intended to provide a physical platform in the Meebane Gallery for such design examples that prioritize and treat nature and architecture as inseparable. The selected work that will be uh, exhibited prompts the importance and role of living systems at many scales and manners of architectural design. So hopefully we will be able to come together there as a community of designers, architects, landscape architects, engineers, and students um, centered on this theme of living wall design and its current proliferation. We're pleased to include and highlight imagery of the work of Claudia Pasquero, Ecologic Studio, and a transcription of this lecture in the catalog. So to give uh, a big welcome to Claudia Pasquero, she is the director of Ecologic Studio, 
an architectural and urban design studio co-founded in London with Marco Paletto. Their studio has an international reputation for its innovative work in systemic design, particularly defined by the combination and integration of bio and sociological research, parametric design, as well as prototyping. Among other projects, their office has completed a public library in Turin and consistently exhibited work at the Venice Architectural Biennale for the last decade. She is now co-authoring a book dedicated to their studio's research, edited by Rutledge, titled Systemic Architecture, Operating Manual for the Self-Organizing City. So we have something to look forward to from their own uh, collection of writing and work. As a lecturer and director of the Urban Morphogenesis Lab at the Bartlett UCL, Claudia experiments with the application of recent scientific findings within unconventional computing to various scales of design, from objects to architecture to urban. She is also a professor of landscape architecture and, founding, and founder of Synthetic Landscape Lab at Innsbruck University. She has served as the head curator of the Tallinn Architectural Biennale in 2017 and was nominated among many other awards uh, in the Wired Smart List of the same year. Before we hear her talk today titled Biodigital Aesthetics as a Value System of Post-Anthropocene Architecture, I am hoping we can prompt her to uh, speak about the themes of the would have been symposium and the topic of other nature. And so a brief dialogue with Claudia. So I've had um, the pleasure of pulling together a few questions that she would have potentially or will have will cover in her talk, but that I hope she can speak directly to through this um, introductory introductory dialogue. So I feel we would be hard pressed today not to discuss the current pandemic uh, crisis that has uh, put us in this position of a virtual lecture series and whereby the world has really been reminded that even the smallest animal, plant, particle can affect global change. In a positive sense, a butterfly, a bug, or in the case of the work of Ecologic Studio, bacteria and algae might be prioritized in architecture and given opportunities to make a difference. So Claudia, welcome. And I'm wanting to hear your thoughts on how you feel a critical practice of architecture should be accountable for aiding and resolving the development of the Anthropocene in this manner. Um. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for the question and thanks for the invite to the lecture and exhibition. I'm glad to be here today to discuss this topic with you and with everybody that would have my own question later. Uh, to answer to the first question, um, some of the topic that we have recently discussed uh, in, in lecture through our work and my, Mark and myself PhD and in the for, forthcoming book that we are developing with Routledge is the fact that uh, we believe architecture um, has inherited from modernity a sense of aesthetic which excludes some of the microorganisms that was played the planet. Still the idea of the wide surface is the idea uh, that is predominant and the bacteria and the microorganisms such as the algae that can bloom uh, over many of the sea of the planet uh, or fungi that uh, grows on molding fruit are excluded by the uh, discourse of design and, and aesthetic. This is the scale uh, at the scale of aesthetic and material but has got repercussion also at the urban scale. Often uh, we are preoccupied with the design of city and we are still relying on a model that considers the inhabitable quarter, the housing, separated from the infrastructure, from the area where the processing of waste and the byproduct of our civilization is happening. The fact is that this byproduct, by being separated by the, by the inhabitable unit, is also separated from our consciousness. We don't see it and therefore we cannot interact with it. 
Somehow we have a sanitized idea of beauty, but also a sanitized idea of green. We talk about green, green in city, but we should talk in reality, in our opinion, not only about regreening, which because we cannot bring back this slider and fix a temporary perturbed biosphere, but in systemic way term, we should talk about waste, pollutant, element that can smell, can create uncomfortable feeling, but can also, if designed, become again part of the equation. And they have exceptional, some of the bacteria that we deal with, I have exceptional property of creating new material, new space, spatial organization, and could become part of a new design ethos and a new aesthetic. This is uh, um, uh, concluding my, my answer, this is very much related to, uh, is visible on the response that we had in the current pandemics, where the spatial response is still the one of segregation, rather the one of understanding of a systemic organism. Mm -hmm. I know we'll see many examples of this in your talk, so we'll move on and I think the audience will take note of where they're already seeing some of the future in your work and uh, how this question is being addressed. I think for the next question and the only next question, um, uh, we would agree, we would have to agree that we're experiencing uh, ubiquity to the digital like never before. Your work, um, anyone who knows it uh, can, know that there's a particular affinity between nature and technology. Um, but I'm particularly interested in what you foresee with the future of architecture, either practice or academic, and how that holds an interdependency of the terms nature and technology. Well, uh, the question is that uh, for us, uh, um, the realm of the biological and the technological world are somehow interconnected. And so the urban sphere or the apparatus that uh, uh, sustain uh, the growing metabolism of, uh, of, of a global city and therefore um, our life um, is uh, uh, drastically interwoven with the natural biosphere. The two are inseparable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, the technological regime, the, the urban sphere and the biosphere are interconnected at one single thing. And just as such, in our opinion, can be designed. Um, in this sense, uh, also, we are interested in trying to understand how we can deploy novel technique of design that are not about, uh, um, let's say, taming this flow, but interacting with them. So it becomes a question of how you interact with other form of intelligence, being there artificial or, or natural. Mm -hmm. So there's potentially a dependency on the spontaneity of what comes out of that interdependency. Well, uh, spontaneity is an interesting word because uh, uh, somehow for us, uh, the, the question is how do we interact and how visual languages enable us to read information that we would not be able to uh, read otherwise, both in biological that in artificial system. Mm -hmm. like. Fantastic. Thank you for your thoughts today. Um, and I would like to welcome uh, Claudia Pasquero and her talk, Biodigital Aesthetics as a Value System of post-Anthropocene architecture. So, the topic uh, of my lecture is, Danel pointed out is, uh, Biodigital aesthetic as value system of post Anthropocene architecture. Uh, this is also the title of a paper that uh, Marco and myself have recently written. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, timely. It is timely 
within the Anthropocene era, more than ever before, to search for non-anthropocentric modern reason and consequently of design. This has investi been investigated in my studio, but also in my research work in academia. And together between this entity, we have created a consortium called the Photosynthetica Consortium that in fact include Ecologic Studio, as well as uh, the Bartlett UCL and this group university. The consortium has been pursuing architecture as a research-based practice, exploring the interdependence of digital and biological intelligence in design by working directly with non-human living system. Why non-human living system? We focus this research on capturing the diagrammatic capacity of bioorganisms, such as spider, molds, and microalgae. Their responsive behavior and growth to become part of a complex biodigital architecture. A key focus of this work is on training architectural sensibility, rethinking our sensibility as architect, and our ability to recognize pattern of connectivity and reasoning across discipline, to deeper understand their materialities and technological regime, and thus expand the repertoire of aesthetic quality for our design practice. Recent development in evolutionary psychology demonstrate that the human sense of beauty and pleasure is part of a co-evolutionary co system of our mind and its surrounding environment. In this term, human sense of beauty and pleasure have evolved as a selection mechanism, cultivating and enhancing, enable us to compensate and integrate the function of our logical thinking enable us to gain a systemic view of planet Earth and the dramatic changes it is currently undergoing. This talk seeks to illustrate to a series of recent and less recent projects that range from small sculpture, like the metaphorly that you see here, to large master plan, our new appreciation of beauty and aesthetic in architecture has evolved into an operational tool capable to design and measure its actual ecological intelligence, while overcoming a purely stylistic reading of architectural aesthetics. This work embraces a profound computational nature of biological systems as the act of collective intelligence or computation, thinking, wit. Aesthetic is often, as I mentioned before, absent from any urban planning discussion. However, aesthetic architects and planners often rely on a sanitized and therefore highly aestheticized view of the world ecosystem, exemplified by the very notion of blue-green planning and this focus on regreening city. This notion may be the one the most endured aspect we have inherited from modernity. To us, reassessing the dark side of urban ecology brings up a necessity for opening up a new aesthetic of nature and as a consequence of architecture. This new aesthetic connects the architectural discourse to the realm of microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi. This creature endowed with an exceptional ability to turn waste and pollution into nutrients and raw material. This color and material domain unveil the missing link and redefine the confederate urban metabolism across scale. Ecology Studio Biodigital Architecture promote a new urban aesthetic centered on an overappreciation of the bacterial microscale, as well as other focus of non-human intelligence. Within our body of work and research, the cultivation of these microorganisms becomes an act of culturalization as their direct foreword in the realm of architecture. The fungi 
microorganisms, algae, and the form of biological artificial intelligence become for us biocitizen. Another example of this type of culturalization is the series Ortus, which began in 2012 and is currently still ongoing. Ortus is the Latin term for garden and the R stands for hydroorganism responsive to urban stimuli. It, is, it refers to a series of photosynthetic sculptures like the one you see here, part of the collection of the ZKM in Karsuen, and urban structure that create artificial habitat for some bacteria, some of the older organisms on the planet integrated into built and spatial form. Within Ortus, cyanobacteria deploy not only as photosynthetic machines, but they also absorb emission from building system. Ortus constitute a new active layer that is part of both urban and natural metabolic cycle, reconnecting the so-called green and dark sides of the ecology. The latest instance of this concept is a biodigital piece titled Ortus XL Access Team. It was first presented at the Certain Portpidou in Paris in 2019 as part of the seminal exhibition La Fabrique du Vivant. This specific installation is inspired by study on the collective behavior of coral colonies and their morphogenesis. Morphogenesis is for us a key term. We would like to promote a shift from architect working with morphology that if you check in Wikipedia, is a static uh, collection of form to morphogenesis, which is instead the process of becoming conformed form under the pressure of matter, information and energy. In the, in, in the model of the coral, of the coral polyps, Individual polyps host microalgae called zoosantelle within their tissues. As the algae photosynthesize, they provide a metabolic flow of energy to the polyps, which in turn build their exoskeleton of cultural carbonate, more exposure to sunlight, resulting for more rapid growth. This positive feedback loop enables the characteristic convoluted morphology of many known coral species to emerge. Ortus XL Access and Team G deploys an algorithm to simulate a growth of a three dimensional substratum inspired by the coral morphogenesis. The result is a set of digital meshes that are subsequently analyzed. And two of them are selected as inner and outer layer of the 3D printed substratum for the structure. Each vertex of the mesh represents a virtual version of the coral polyps. The substrato is for the developing a 3D printable structure. This structure, as in the case of coral, is the developed to support the proliferation of colony of cyanobacteria that will inhabit in its individual cell, as you can see here, the biopixel. Each cell is therefore occupying the interstitial space between the inner and the outer layer. These two layers are then translated into a porous field on contour slide indexing solar radiation. The curvilinear pro profile provides partial enclosure to the cell while enabling light penetration and oxygen CO2 exchange. Among the oldest organisms on Earth, the cyanobacteria unique biological intelligence is now gathered and organized by means of the latest innovation in 3D printing. The scale of architectural detailing and the urban microbiomes become here compatible, conjuring a new form of biodigital architecture. Noticeably, this enables multiple interaction in building that can now be activated by the intelligence of microalgae. The microorganisms grow faster in the biodigital environment than they do in the wild, because in this artificial habitat, they are very closely connected with human life. Man-made emission like heat and carbon dioxide, for instance, stimulate the biomass growth. What we call pollution is not pollution per se, becomes a nutrient for microalgae with which we can create an alliance. The biomass in turn can be used as a source of energy and food. 
This is a new type of symbiosis, a form of bioarchitectural symbiosis. The architectural dimension of this biosymbiosis and interaction between human and non-human has been also has been further explored in this, in this installation in the research developed for the uh, Art, Mori Art Museum in Tokyo uh, at the end of last year. Suspended at the 53rd floor of the Mori Tower and with the background of Tokyo Urban Sprawl, the culture, the sculpture materializes in urban dimension becomes somehow a new prototype of living architecture. Embodies uh, the project that we call photosynthetic tower, which unfold the, the architectural implication of Ortus and the embodiment of Tokyo evolution in a future bio powerhouse or biodigital culture and technology. At the city scale, it appears as a complex synthetic organism in which bacteria, autonomous of farming machine, and other form of mean animal intelligence become biocitizens. Alongside humans, they all contribute to the new form of Tokyo own synthetic urban landscape. The intricate morphology of photosynthetic tower at its sheer scale promotes a significant microclimatic effect. The prevailing wind generates enough draft and turbulence to form both the natural seeds and their pollution to its porous skin. In much, each model of, of this skin is then activated locally to evolve into a unique function. In order to promote the evolution of this concept, we have recently launched the Photosynthetic Adventure, a transdisciplinary design innovation project, which brings together practice and academia. In the last two years, the venture has built a series of large-scale one-to-one demonstrators of photosynthetic building membranes, sometimes also referred to as photosynthetic urban curtains. The first demonstrator was unveiled in November 2019 in Dublin, Ireland. It's 32 meters long and 7 meters high. The membrane was designed specifically for the climate kick. EU most prominent climate innovation initiative aimed at accelerating the adoption of natural-based solution to tackle the global climate crisis. Conceived as an urban curtain, the photosynthetic captures CO2 from the atmosphere and stores it in real time at a rate of approximately one kilo of CO2 per day, which is equivalent to that of 20 large trees. Composed of 16 modules, each two meters wide and seven meters tall, this unique quarter prototype envelops the first and second floor of the main facade of the Printworks building at Dublin Castle. Each model functions as a photobioreactor, a digitally designed and fabricated bioplastic container that utilize daylight to feed living microagriculture and release luminescent shades at night. The photosynthetic system Integra was then tested in Helsinki and multiple locations, Helsinki, as you can see here, and integrate three layers of functionality. The wetware, the sele that selection and management of the multiple microalgae culture that as you've seen in some of the images before, range of also in color. The software, the digital management, si management system that uses sensor to optimize performance in real time. It also provides long-term projection and prediction of the system carbon capturing and air cleaning capability. The hardware, the artificial habitat for cultivation of the living culture, the spatial organization made by the photobioreactor. The project combines digital design and fabrication technology to optimize aesthetic quality and environmental performance in architectural integrated systems. This was further tested in the Bayoteca Astana, the first permanent photosynthetic architecture, originally uh, developed for the Astana Expo, and then remaining as a museum of biotechnology, simulates a urban dwelling of uh, 180 square meters, able to host a family of four. It's composed of three areas the garden, the living, and the night, where we have. Um, bioluminescent bacteria, 
uh, the living where a scientist in residence was demonstrating what, uh, what is possible to do with the property of algae, algae of microalgae cultivated in the biotech act from uh, food to energy to multiple resources. Absorb CO2 by the build, from the building and uh, transforms it. Uh, the biotech act in itself uh, is able to sustain itself in terms of food and energy. It promotes the shift from architecture as a machine for living to architecture as a living machine. In this sense, the photosynthetic venture is driven by a so strong technological agenda that results in the formation of a des design innovation venture. However, at its core lies a fundamental design research that has been maturing over the last several years. Architectural technology for us must not lose sight of its aesthetical dimension. Its power to communicate through its morphology, its beauty, especially in the anthropogenic scene age, a time where perhaps paradoxically, the non-anthropocentric mode of reasoning is becoming ubiquitous. The aesthetic reasoning is becoming more and more critical. Photosynthetica relies in its daily functioning on a combination of digital, human and non-human intelligence. Its crucial role is to interface this form of reasoning to create a channel of communication and cross-fertilization, to stimulate, in other words, our collective sensibility in recognizing patterns of reasoning across discipline, new form of materiality and technological regime. The form of human to non-human communication might be even more evident in other form of research project that we have been working on. Xenoderma, a project that was also included in the exhibition La Fabrique de Vivant at the Center Pompidou, mobilized animal intelligence. Spider mind in this eastern Asian fauna tarantula do not completely reside in their bodies. As their web actually constitute a form of spatial thinking. Information from the web becomes integral part of the cognitive system. The behavior of the spiders and the production of silk could be reprogrammed to the design of 3D printer architectural structure and their geometrical feature. The experiment developed for this project consciously seek a productive ambiguity to reveal the only, the only beauty of silk morphologies. An intelligence that resides somewhere at the intersection of the biological, technological, and digital regimes. It is this aesthetic of nature that we seek to highlight to question its conventional meaning in the contemporary architectural discourse. But ecologic studio and my practice and research work, first experimentation in biocomputation date more than 10 years ago, the author's early co conceptualization of this experiment as part of the architectural at the time model is found in an apparatus that we call polycephalum machine. At its core is a living biological organism that you can see here, slime mold, or in scientific term, Physarium polycephalum. Physarium polycephalum is a single cell organism which contains hundreds of cellular thousands of tiny nuclei. Through their lifetime, nuclei become a float and are able to interact with each other by means of many biochemical sec secretion. This is the process that sciences have named bioartificial intelligence, a new form of biological computation. Physarium polycephalum accumulates its traces in the environment that form a distributed spatial memory. This is a form of outsourced brain. It is through multiple local interaction among nuclei and environment that Physarium polycephalum overall morphology emerge. These low level interactions are for higher level collective intelligence that evolve in the absence of nervous system. In one of the recent experiments presented originally at the Tallinn Biennale of Architecture in 2006, of which I've been the curator, we develop a 3D printed substrato based on the urban morphology of Tallinn, Estonian capital. The urban substrate was inoculated with Physarium polycephalum. 
Remarkably, Tizarium Polycephalum network body grew to resemble minimize urban detour network, the ones that typically evolved in hundreds of years of urban growth and connected all the relevant resources while using overall minimum expenditure of energy. Adapting recognizing pattern or reasoning across scalar, temporal, and technological domains, Fisari Polycephalum Collective Intelligence operate well beyond the classical ranges of modern master planning. They observe spatial quality that the polyphenol machine behavior offer become a critical lens for us as designers in participating in training new design sensibility and testing their potential into recent planning projects by Utani and the Deep Green. By Utali. Critically, and without many us noticing, today we inhabit the urban sphere, a global apparatus of the network of informational, material, and energetic infrastructure that sustain our increasingly demanding metabolism. This condition of contemporary urbanity enables endosymbiotic relationship to unexpectedly emerge within the heterogeneous of the urban sphere. In the city of Italy itself, the biological evolution negotiates contaminated habitats with ubiquitous form of artificial intelligence. The emerging aesthetic quality that we capture through the videos and drawing produced within the polycephal machine has become a framework for an operational design method used towards enabling a progressively higher degree of synthesis among the heterogeneous system of the urban sphere. Fisano Polycephano Alien Beauty promote the emergence of a novel aesthetic system in architecture and project the image of Tallinn future ecological infrastructures. The microscopic world of Fisano Polycephano distributed in challenges challenge the logic of traditional planning processes, thus laying the ground for a co-evolutionary architecture that can be grown by an exerted cohort of biocytosine, the polycephalon nuclei. Strategic planning is the related interface with the material processes by related molecular transactions that underpin a form of urban symbiosis. In 2018, the BioTalin project was further developed as part of the res a research aiming at proposing the first comprehensive building planning for the Estonian capital of Tallinn. Just like Fisarium Polycephalon, the emerging urban form of BioTali manifests the pulsating rhythm of the city blue green infrastructure, not as a form of, of four, five, ten blue corridors, but millions of them, while embracing the, the morphological complexity of the city, network, and ungrabbable fuzziness of its physical boundary all of which defy both the classical canons of beauty and the rational logic of efficient engineering. So while typical blue-green urban planning still promote a typologically driven design methodology that has not evolved much in our opinion since the time of the garden city movement in the late 19th and 20th century, biodigital master planning can promote a paradigm that recognizes the opportunity offered by the inevitable merging of digital and biodigital intelligence, the intersection of the biosphere and the urban sphere. Could this aesthetic kind of promote a new planning sensibility based on the application of artificial and biological intelligence? Incapable of tackling, tackling the global problems of designing sustainable and resilient cities. In other words, could it provide a global design toolkit that is sensible to local stimuli and unique sociocultural pattern? These are the questions that are driving our current 
research agenda and the ongoing collaboration with the United Nations Development Program. Deep Green, our next project, is primarily devoted to the application of artificial intelligence to the so-called blue-green planning of cities, with a particular focus on fast-growing cities in developing countries and the scalability of this method toward global application. Currently, more than half of the world population lives in city, and this number is expected to double by the year 2050. Cities and city regions today are at the forefront in the fight to offset the potentially catastrophic effect of climate change. Cities are the bigger CO2 emitter globally still, and therefore it is necessary to address the redesign of their infrastructure apparatus toward carbon neutrality and material and emergency circularity. In other words, it is crucial for city to learn how to convert what they expect, consider waste, or pollution in raw material to food that can be used for new production processes. This entails innovative strategies of waste management, water conservation and recycling, renewable energy production and carbon trading. It also involves implementing technology for the filtration and the remetabolization of air pollution. However, cities are also our more effective refuge from the potential devastating effect of climate change. This is particularly true for those regions of the world that are most vulnerable to drought, flooding, and famine. We can design these resilient cities that use their size and collective energy to create a refuge for the human and displaced wildlife that promote emergence of positive microclimate, replenish depleted water sources, and restore degraded terrains, thus pushing back on processes such as desertification, land erosion, and contamination. This entails innovative strategies like the one you see here of remetabolizing wasteland for urban regreening and rewilding, as well as for urban agriculture. The problem affecting our city is also the same problem that face humankind as a whole. After all, we are all inhabit the collective urban sphere, which is why a global model for a green city planning is required. A critical need for urban planning today is to mobilize a collective agency and system intelligence to face the challenges ahead in this way. Local solutions can be evolved in response to given challenge. In this respect, in our collaboration with the UNDP, we have been testing a potential of artificial intelligence to develop a new green planning interface. This planning framework combines the scalability of complex planning application with a design sensibility and intuitive accessibility of its design interface. It enables a higher degree of customization and criteria evolution for the specific urban application or urban design solution. At this core, this application uses algorithms to analyze high resolution urban landscape and infrastructure data to produce a simulated scenario of sustainable urban development. The data is open source GIS information available even for rather remote and undeveloped region of the world. This scenario based simulation has three characteristics. They are open to multiple external input they are time-based and non-linear. They have a clear visual and morphological output that is investigated. One of our test bed uh, that has been investigated in the last couple of years is Guatemala City. In Guatemala City, this, the scenario and the contrast between the urban sphere and the biosphere are exacerbated by a serious lack of waste management. The water, Guatemala City garbage dump is the biggest landfill in Central America, containing over a third of the total garbage in the country. 
99% of Guatemala City 2,240 garbage sites have no environmental system and are classified as illegal. A new de de design methodology powered by big data gathering and the production of algorithm design scenario, ena which enables enable us to reframe this condition and try to tackle some of the geological problem called as the mismanagement of waste and water, called barrancos. The interface that we have designed allow the simulation in computation, optimization, or contrasting parameters, and the development of, of a multi-scalar approach. The urban regreening strategy is therefore multiple hierarchies. Locally, it recognizes the gaps in the urban vegetation and gives guidance for the plantings of tree in optimal location. At the scale of the neighborhood, it optimizes the location of, of water collection point that serve the existing building. At the urban scale, it fosters identification of the vegetative network to promote the emergence of ecological niches and local microclimates, especially around water collection zone. While at the territorial scale, it promotes the emergence of barriers, natural and man-made, to push back the potential of desertification and restore some of the abandoned agricultural plot, as well as the infrastructural network of canals and water wells. To conclude my talk, we believe that the key purpose of our practice is to train our sensibility as architect, as well as the one of our partners and client are recognizing is emerging pattern of reasoning across multiple disciplines and in a transcalar manner, materiality, technological, and regime. And thus expanding our practice repertoire of aesthetic quality in lieu of ecological design. Aesthetic here is intended as a form of meta language, a non-verbal language enable a more complex level of communication between human, but also, and especially, with non-human partners. It is therefore no longer a case of architecture being inspired by other disciplines, such as biology or computer science, and striving to become biomimetics or biophilics. Rather, it is time to realize that architecture can give to other disciplines precisely because of its self-contained materiality, a contribution to the actualization of new reimagined reality, new words. Architecture as an embedded algorithm acquire its own non-human biointelligence and sensibility, which must be trained, understood, cultivated and culturalized. For this reason, we feel that it is critical to avoid the trap of simply borrowing new tools and technology while applying them to the solution of ever increasing architectural challenge. Rather, rather it is critical to deploy them as technique to assess the non-human, the participatory, to shift our perspective beyond the boundary of the rational, such a shift as the power to greet, greatly expand the space of solution by reproblematizing the given problem. We need to ask new questions before providing solution to what we consider the norm. And somehow, there has never been a better time for architecture to claim this fundamental societal role. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I wish at this moment that you could hear an applause from the audience as would normally be the case in a, in a lecture hall. Um, I, yes, <laughs> um, I very much appreciate the work that you showed from your earlier uh, years and the range of scale that your work um, dives into. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we felt that this could be a good time for the audience to ask questions. Um, 
I don't see any in the chat. So if anybody would like to ask Claudia uh, something more direct of her work, um, please type that into the group chat now and I can relay the questions to her or if it's easier to raise your small hand in your window, I can try to find um, or see all of those as well, but that's a bit more difficult for me to see um, from my screen. Um, and maybe while we're giving people the chance to formulate their questions or type it in, I could ask something of, of the project that I find most intriguing, which you probably know from all my emails and requests uh, for what would be included in the exhibit. I'm um, very interested in the sort of um, variables and variations of the Photosynthetica project that is this facade treatment uh, that you've done different iterations of in 2019 and that I feel is a kind of building scale response to your research. And at the, in some many ways, it follows with the morphogenesis of what you're interested in, in terms of where the cavities are and, and potentially the design of those. But I, I do feel like it addresses an efficiency or um, some of the applicability to the building scale that your more sculptural and aesthetic pieces uh, do not. And that's not why I like it, but it is to me somewhat of a different approach than some of the more sculptural um, endeavors. Do you find that when you address the architectural scale as opposed to the prototyping or the interior scale that certain factors of, of force change for you and Ecologic Studio, or is this just a small sample of something much more to come? Well, uh, we uh, always uh, have seen the work we develop in academia as a way of uh, then uh, uh, scaling up to the architectural and urban scale. So, in that sense, uh, uh, our work has always been uh, transcalar. Um, some of the prototype that uh, we have developed, uh, and now I show some of them in this lecture, I didn't necessarily uh, discuss the genealogy of the different prototype. Uh, they were somehow instrumental for us to uh, develop different aspect of research that later we could implement in larger pro prototype or in multiple prototypes. So in this sense, uh, uh, both Mark and myself as a practice-based PhD, and we believe that all this, uh, the experimental work that is embodied in some of the exhibition can uh, feed uh, um, later on the photosynthetic adventure. The photosynthetic adventure is a spin-off, so it's uh, uh, based on the idea of design innovation. And so it embodies, uh, um, aspect of research developed previously. For example, in this case, you see we have been using multiple uh, um, species of so microalgae. Microalgae are often thought to be green, but uh, there are in reality thousands of species. Uh, it's something we started to investigate in 2010 with a more artistic installation at the uh, Architectural Association. And then we have brought forward in this particular case in Dublin, also in relation to um, the microclimate in which we were embedded. Uh, that it was winter in Dublin, so relatively cold. Uh, we use uh, marine, local marine microalgae and their color uh, vary from the red to the brown to the green. So in this case, uh, uh, we use microalgae that could perform at the best locally, harvesting also on a knowledge that we have developed before uh, in some of our uh, smaller installation. Mm. So somehow the photosynthetic project embeds at the architectural scale, uh, many of the characteristics we've investigated before, both at the level of material then at the level of uh, um, overall system design. Very good. We have a question from 
from the audience from Traylon Patterson. He or she says, uh, I believe you touched on it, but how is the algae curtain wall affecting air quality? Also, how much more affecting is algae compared to trees? You had an example in the presentation, but I forgot that number. Okay. Um, one uh, uh, square meter of photosynthetica is uh, equivalent to a large uh, tree. Um, I have the diagram as well. I didn't put it in the presentation. Um, I'm not against tree, I have to say. <laughs> I would like to underline that it's not a battle against tree. We are promoting microalgae uh, and the use of microalgae because they are particularly uh, efficient in terms of photosynthesis and in terms of remetabolization of some of the waste that our society produce. As a matter of fact, microalgae are in itself a waste. They are blooming in many of the sea and ocean that uh, cover the planet because they are very resilient and because they nurture and they, their nutrient are uh, minerals that are a byproduct from our industry. So um, they are uh, extremely productive in comparison to large trees because they are bacteria. So in this case, we are talking about not macroalgae, but microalgae. Spirulina is really visible with the naked eye, but the other are not. You need a microscope uh, to recognize them. And uh, being so small, they don't use uh, uh, any of the energy that produced through photosynthesis in their structural body, as large tree do. Uh, but rather, uh, they uh, use everything in photosynthesis. So they are uh, 20, 30 times more uh, productive in absorbing some of the elements that are present in the urban air. Um, through their body. And these are multiple elements. I don't know if I need to go very specific here, but of course, the photosynthesis absorbs CO2, but through the, the air passing through the water and the microalgae release also uh, particles, uh, so elements that constitute uh, PM 2.5, PM 10, uh, NOx, and other elements that are present in the air. So it's not simply about CO2 and metabolization, but also uh, somehow. Um, uh, reformulation or re metabolization of the air when it goes through the curtain or through the photobioreactor. Um, then it depends uh, the type of microalga. You can then harvest the biomass and uh, use it for food or other, or other uh, purpose. This is because uh, these elements that are absorbed by the, from the air, they get remetabolized. I use this word a lot, I don't know, maybe I should unpack it. It means the algae feed on it. So the pollutants are not in the water anymore. They get, they become food for the algae. They allow them to grow biomass. That's why the algae can become then food in itself and protein. He says, thank you. I have another question from Charles E. Weber, the second. Can you talk about how you imagine the life cycle of these structures? Does the algae need to be maintained or replaced? How might the system affected when the structures need replacement or modification? So um, I, I don't like to talk about maintenance. I'd like to talk about gardening and interaction. Uh, because uh, um, in this sense, uh, of course, the algae will need interaction. They are a living organism, but this, but by daily interaction, uh, there is also a question of, of learning and implementation can be part of it. In larger facade, uh, this in interaction can be automated. This cultivation can be automated, become a form of cyber gardening. Um, in a smaller system like the Boyabombola that I show at the end, there can be a daily interaction with the user uh, as, a form of, as a form of cultivation. And in terms of life cycle of the facade, at the moment, uh, the one you see here is made with polyair, which is 89% uh, um, starch based bioplastic. So we imagine that this is more like a curtain. And in fact, that was the name that was used. And um, it's got an infrastructure, but can eventually be um, remelted 
uh, with a life cycle of, let's say, uh, shorter than a, than a facade, let's say, in ETFE. So the system with bioplastic, we imagine that every 10 year could be, could be re-implemented. And um, of course, it's cheaper, easier to install, lighter, that's more like a form of external curtain, bristle and can be re-metabolized continuously. While the system with ETFE, which is the one that, uh, um, that is uh, this one, this is in a smaller prototype, but we have larger one, has a longer uh, lifespan because uh, ETFE, of course, uh, can be used for many here. In this case, we have microalgae inside and water rather than air that inflate uh, uh, the, the cushion. So there are different systems uh, that uh, can be more or less uh, temporary. For we, we have been pushing a lot to the use of bioplastic and we are investigating also the use of bioplastic that contain microalgae itself. And we are interested on this idea of the of the short lifespan and continue re-metabolization and change of the building. Of course, um, everything has got uh, is, uh, is uh, time, but uh, yeah, that, that's what we are investigating at the moment. Did I miss any hands being raised or would someone else like to add a question to the chat? Clay Odom asks or states, I was wondering where Claudia sees the work in relation to science fiction. Does the work fall more along the lines of a speculative pro provocation or as a future that must occur? Um, no, I don't see the work as a provocation. I'm not an expert of science fiction myself, but uh, um, I don't see the work as a, a provocation. I see uh, the uh, work uh, is uh, work in prototype, but uh, the reason why uh, there are multiple type of prototypes is that some prototype investigate more spatial articulation and aesthetic quality, and other prototype uh, investigate more the, the working of the system and the system of the microalgae, the working with pump, the medium in which the microalgae grow, that can be water or gel. Uh, but um, the, um, the way we conceive uh, the, the work is as prototype that, okay, I wouldn't use the verb must occur because I cannot detect it, <laughs> but uh, uh, we work towards something that we uh, would like to uh, promote to occur because we, uh, in our research, uh, we, um, we are working on the integration of production and remetabolization inside of the architectural and urban system. Um, we also uh, are interested in the fact that design is a high agency on this because uh, somehow the fact that infrastructure, as I said before, has been segregated from our side for a long time, um, is part of the problematic part of the equation. And the fact that uh, mm, mm, infrastructure could be kept brutal and not tackled by architect is again a problematic part of the equation in our opinion, because aesthetic is not just about making a biotechnology prettier, but could really be a language that enable a deeper level of understanding of certain processes through daily interaction that can be visual or physical, depending from the dimension of the uh, prototype itself. But this daily interaction that is enabled by design, it's an important uh, part of the equation for us. What uh, science fiction does is uh, enabling true narrative certain thoughts to emerge, but uh, I don't locate myself in uh, science fiction itself. But uh, uh, even when I work with the most circulative project like uh, uh, slime mold or, or, or spider are always in mind a trajectory toward which this could reach implementation. An implementation that can be slow. I'm a promoter of slowness in the current society as a quality, I think is, <laughs> is a not considered enough quality of the society. So certain process might take time. That doesn't mean that they are fictional or they are there to be purely speculative. I always imagine a mix between the speculative and the actuative. And the more I work on a prototype and the more it gets 
actualized and the less it becomes speculative. Of course, at the beginning of a research, there is a high level of speculation uh, for it to start. Fantastic. Is there another question that someone would like to put forward? Clay says, thank you, as did Charlie Weber. Have I missed anyone's questions? Daniel Kohler. Uh, Daniel Kohler has the question, Danelle. Oh, I don't see that. I see that you raised um, maybe, maybe I have a question. Okay, oh. can I see you I, as well? I got Hey, ah, uh, fantastic. I can thank, see you. thank you so much for this uh, 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 like challenging talk. I think it's so much needed that uh, really like um, question like like modernism and uh, really like um, search uh, for for alternatives. Uh, I mean, like hundred years ago, you know, like uh, uh, no one even could imagine to live in high rises. So why we should not live uh, in uh, grown cone buildings and so on? So. Um, when you, um, I'm interested like in your model of uh, urban morphogenesis or gen genetics, because I think there's like still like some unveiled uh, subversive uh, criticism towards like computation. You tell like that the difference to a typical morphology uh, would be like, uh, like a being, uh, being under the pressure of information so like being like in a way, in a way like what, what you like show for your, for the analysis, uh, uh, what's uh, I think really new is uh, in this course is this enormous vast scalability from, uh, from just a, a bacteria or like the, the interaction of a bacteria to the scale of a territory or a city, which is like, uh, especially in the, in the new projects when you show like you can actually orchestrate with one single algorithm today, like the brick and, and in a way like the complete landscape of a city, which is of course like also like leads, I mean a city or like any ecology, it's never totalitarian, it's, it's never one. So I mean, so, so I see it like also like very subversive in a way that it envies like very much the scalability of, of computation and the scalability of a, of a different kind of in, intelligence but I would be also interested how you see, maybe it refers to a last question of the idea of prototyping, how you would see this in, in interaction with, with other kinds of ecological uh, systems, like birds, trees, and, and like other kind of, even like informational data and so on. Maybe too long. Uh, well, um... I lost a bit of the question can you, on the birds and trees. No, um, you now you you show um, how you can um, like span like a vast uh, 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 like like range of scales, the yeah. scale of a brick to the wall to a building to a, yeah. a, a house uh, or like completely beyond like till you reach like territoriums like even not cities anymore. Yeah. Like you can build actually one. But, but today, like, like uh, in ecology, it's made of uh, millions of different species. Yes. Well, yeah, so, so how, how now uh, these, I have to understand these, these images in, in relation to, to an existing ecology. Well, a like, multiple ecological systems are interconnected. Now I cannot manage my presentation. Okay. Multiple ecological systems are interconnected. And uh, so we usually start by analyzing one. I don't have here the project of Solana Open Aviary that was uh, starting from the pattern of flight of birds. But in a way, what we try to underline in terms of uh, also master planning is how we could use algorithm. And here we are seeing uh, biotalin in which we work exactly, we started exactly from uh, the relationship between um, a, um, ecological ornithological park, uh, which is present in the peninsula of Paliasare. It is the one that we see here a bit in a zoom in way. And the contrast that existed between the 
ornithological park and the wastewater treatment plant of uh, Tallinn. So the city of Tallinn, when I, when I was commissioned the Biennale, um, asked us to work on this site uh, because they wanted to make it more urban. But they say, we can't do that because uh, um, there is an ornithological park, uh, which is an ecology, ecological protected area. And there is a wastewater treatment plant that uh, pollute the site. Uh, paradoxically, they saw the two as uh, two segregated zones, but they were segregated by a thin fence. The system present on the side ignored the fence completely, and they act in a much more computational manner. The bacteria that were Escherichia coli that were percolating out of the wastewater treatment plant, unfortunately here you see just a zoom in, but uh, they, they were percolating out of the wastewater treatment plant. Here is the peninsula of Pagliasare. They would create a pond in the nearby ornithological park where specific reeds uh, would grow and um, Scientists have analyzed those reeds and they basically exist only on that site and allow the nest to grow the birds because the, 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 the water is so eutrophied, so full of mineral that uh, a, a sort of new type of reeds emerge. The birds themselves ignore the, the boundary that the politician consider and spend their time on the tank of wastewater processing because they are much warmer in winter and never freeze. So, Somehow, we like to say that when we redesigned this site, we took the birds and, and the bacteria perspective. And from the computational point of view, we started to remodel the site accordingly to, uh, to these two parameters, starting from the way the water will percolate and for the bacteria distribute and the birds uh, flying pattern, which is recorded by data and sensor that are distributed on these birds. Uh, so the remodeling of the site started from these two parameters and the proposal that emerged was a distributed wastewater treatment plant that doesn't use necessarily an architectural system but a light skin system and merge with the ornithological part and the other program in the site. The main obstacle actually to this type of project is often unfortunately um, uh, some ecological regulation, which talk about conservation of site rather than about mapping, reading the diversity of the site, so computing it and transforming it. Because transformation is always a problematic subject when we talk about ecology, but ecology cannot be conserved, so they need to be transformed. I don't know if I answer your question, but... I can't see you yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's an interesting point what you do that say like uh, nature or like e ecosystems cannot be preserved or conserved. And we have to in integrate this into economic in a way system. So we, that is really like, is a different uh, approach to ecology. Like we need, uh, I think there's a subversive project which is over the integration. It's much more towards accelerationism and uh, yeah. And so on. Yeah, it's more about a, a multi-layer system rather than an isolated ecology because the ecology is not isolated by itself. And um, it's interesting that you touch on board because we found ourselves working on ornith ornithological parks many times because uh, effectively they tend to be a little bit segregated from other sites of the city and fence, but then these uh, uh, basically cause them to to a deprivation of ecology. So the ecology when it's isolated, the losing biodiversity and, and, and it's not effectively protected anymore. We have uh, one question coming from our YouTube audience uh, from the LAMS Architectos. Uh, they say, congrats, Claudia. I would like to ask two questions. Do you research with bacteria and yeast? And which software do you think is the best for simulations? Okay, uh, we have been doing 
some project with East in the past, but more in academia. Um, at the moment, I don't have a particular research on East. Um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, um, uh, I have a specific workflow. Uh, we have a specific workflow. They use a different type of uh, software and, and, and coding, but um, I'm more interested in the computational language and in creating languages uh, that are based on a pattern and that can be analyzed um, rather than focusing on a specific uh, rather than focusing on a specific software. So yeah, maybe I would. Uh, do I need to be more specific on this question? I I, I don't like to promote software. <laughs> That's understandable. I uh, maybe the someone from the LAMS Architectos can uh, contact you directly or potentially read some of your conference or writings and deduce that that work. I think that's always a bit um, questionable too uh, in discussing workflows. Um, but I think it is is a valid question to know what what you use and how you're getting uh, to achieve some of the results that you do. Well, uh, later, lately we started to use, work with GAN algorithm and interface. Uh, some of the research on the deep green, we were interfacing GAN algorithm with, uh, with, uh, with slime mold, uh, some of the more um, advanced uh, uh, research that we have done. Uh, but uh, also simply, we've been working quite a lot with uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, particularly the base in Rome, uh, to um, uh, simply understand how to read uh, their satellite data and transform them in map. Uh, we have multiple versions, for example, of the Peninsula of Pariasar, many of the projects we did at the urban scale because we work with ESA in trying to understand how the information they got from the satellite can be processed for architecture. That is an interesting question because uh, the algorithm that exists at the moment and the process, the, the, the third generation, the data that the ESA uh, receive are mainly algorithms that have been um, developed by either the war or the agri agricultural industry. Uh, so, of course, we work a lot with landscapes, so some of these algorithms are pertinent for us, but then we work a lot with them to try and understand how we tune in and how we read elements that are more specific to our research rather than to other fields. Any other last questions? I don't see any, any hands raised. Well, if uh, there are no other questions, I wanna thank you, Claudia, for your time and energy put into showing us uh, your projects and the work that's developed um, over many years. And we look forward to the publication that is underway and future Biennale exhibitions from yourself. And then of course the work that will be included in the Other Nature exhibit uh, next February. I look forward to future co correspondence um, with you and really am so pleased that uh, you were finally able to join us um, today for uh, a talk with our students and our faculty and everyone of the community at UTSOA. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invite. I look forward to the follow up and uh, the publication and see how the exhibition evolves. Yes. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.